we welcome uh, you, uh, students, and I see some faculty and staff here in the audience as well uh, for this uh, great opportunity to uh, hear from our uh, local assembly member, uh, Mike Gatto. I'd like to give you a little bit of the uh, formal introduction uh, in case some of you are not as up on uh, our assembly district. Uh, and so uh, assembly member Mike Gatto was elected to represent the uh, 43rd district of the state assembly in a special election in June of 2010. And that special election was necessary because the uh, previous holder of that office went on to uh, become a member of the LA uh, City Council. Uh, that meant that uh, Mr. Gatto uh, had to uh, step forward in the special election. Uh, there was uh, an open primary at which he defeated two Democrats and then the uh, regular election uh, in June for a runoff, uh, and he won, obviously. And then uh, shortly thereafter, he had to run for the regular term in November of 2010 and then uh, followed up by a re-election in 2012, and uh, each of those times has uh, received over 60% of the votes. Uh, uh, solid uh, support for anyone running for office. They'd all like to have 60% of the vote. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, our 43rd Assembly District includes the cities of Atwater Village, Burbank, Glendale, Ho Hollywood, La Cañada, Flint Ridge, La Crescenta, Los Files, Montrose, and Silver Lake. And from someone who's come in from uh, Northern California seven some months ago, that's a pretty darn good territory to be covering a, and a group of uh, people to be representing, and he does that well. Uh, Assemblymember Gatto uh, grew up in Franklin Hills and Silver Lake, uh, earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from UCLA and a law degree from Loyola Law School. Uh, he has been an aide to a congressman, served in the administrations of LA mayors, uh, has practiced and does practice law, primarily representing small and mid-sized businesses and helping them uh, get through uh, the variety of uh, government uh, challenges that they face in running a successful business. Uh, he is uh, the chair of the Assembly Appropriations Committee, uh, a very, very important committee in the Assembly, and has been Assistant Speaker Pro Tem. Um, anyone who has achieved those uh, types of titles and positions uh, clearly knows the inner workings of the legislature, uh, but also uh, he has uh, earned the respect of his peers uh, in getting that position. But I think it's important to recognize that uh, the Sacramento Bee uh, has uh, designated uh, Assembly Member Gatto as the second most independent democratic legislature in the assembly not just voting the party line, but the second most independent. I think that's proof that uh, it is possible to be a leader, to vote your conscience, to vote what is best for the state of California and your area, and not be in lockstep. So we appreciate that kind of leadership. Uh, the LA Daily News at one time, I suppose they still do, calls him fiscally minded and intelligent. Uh, and we in Glendale and at Glendale Community College uh, call him friend and we are pleased to have him uh, with us to share uh, what it is to be uh, a member of the assembly and what it's like a uh, day in the life of a legislator in Sacramento. So assembly member Mike Gatto, Thank glad you, to have you here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Vire. I really appreciate that wonderful introduction. I assure you that none of it is true. Um, <laughs> no, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate the kind words. And obviously, uh, uh, Professor Hoffman, uh, for letting me um, come talk before. This is your class, right? Mostly. Wonderful. And thank you to all of you who have come here and uh, decided to listen to me on, a, uh, on an afternoon. I hope to make it as interesting as possible and answer all of your questions as well. So I'm Mike Otto, I represent the 43rd District in the state legislature. Hopefully you all remember the, the name of the communities that I represent. So it starts in Hollywood, it goes through Silver Lake, Los Feliz, Atwater Village, Glendale, where we are now obviously, Montrose, Burbank, La Cañada, La Crescenta, and then goes through the, the Angeles National Forest all the way to the Palmdale border. So it's a big district, it's about 500,000 people. How many people here today live in one of those communities? Good, I would hope most of you, I would hope most of you. So you're all my constituents, which means that you're my boss. Um, ultimately, I assume most of you are registered to vote, and it's my job to represent you in the state legislature. State Assembly, anyone know what the State Assembly is? I just started on Tuesday That's fine. I, I, was, I, was, I was at the airport one day, and I was dressed just like this, and, 
you know, I was running to catch a flight and uh, some airport personnel was running alongside me or something. And uh, finally I got to my flight and some guy stopped me and said, oh, you know, you, you look familiar, what do you do? And I said, well, I, I'm in the state assembly. And he said, he was like really impressed. I could tell by his face. And then he paused for a minute and he said, what exactly do you assemble? <laughs> so I get that people don't understand all the time what we do. Um, and, but here's an easy way to remember it. We are Congress for the state of California. California calls it the assembly, but we are the lower house in the state of California. We have a Senate, we call it the Senate, but our lower house we call the assembly. So you can think of me as a California Congress member. So we, we do two things. We set all California laws. Anyone know an example of California law? Pick one that's really annoying. You can't talk on a cell phone while you drive the car. That's a California law. Uh, just about everything that governs, I would submit, your day-to-day -day life is set by your state legislature. Uh, the second thing that we do is we set the budget for the state of California. So we, we fund things like, I don't know, I'm going to pick a crazy topic here, higher education. We set the budget, right? So we determine when, when tax dollars go through Sacramento, we determine how they will then flow out to all the different things that are very important to everybody in this room. So that's our primary job. Um, the, the interesting thing for me was going to Sacramento in the first place. Um, it is definitely a very unique place. Um, it's not like day-to-day -day life. Um, I had worked in politics before, I had worked in government, but I was just a regular lawyer, you know, living my life, uh, opening up the newspaper every day, shaking my fist at it just like everybody else does, and I decided to run for office. And I was not given much of a chance to win. As a matter of fact, um, I, nobody thought I would. I, it was a very big field, a lot of people were favored over me. Um, and by some sheer miracle, you know, I actually did end up winning. And going to Sacramento is a really eye-opening experience. It's not like everyday life. Um, I came in there and I was, uh, I was it, you know, as the introduction said, it was a special election. So I came up there in the middle of a term. I mean, it would be, be kind of like going into a very high pressure class just in the middle of the year and just, Nobody knew who I was. I didn't know who anybody else was. At the time that I got elected, I was the youngest Democrat in the legislature, too. So my first few days in office, everybody mistook me for a page boy. Um, I would show up, you know, a big, important assembly member, I thought, and people would say, hey, pass a note to, you know, somebody. And so it was, it was kind of rough. And then, um, you know, we commute to work. Um, my commute involves a Southwest jet. So I get on a Southwest jet. I fly to Sacramento. And uh, we're in session Monday through Thursday. We have committee hearings and stuff like that. So, you know, I, second airplane story or second airport story, I hope you'll indulge me, but um, I, you know, I used to fly back and forth and people would see me in a suit, you know, on an, in an airport around the right time and, and I, I kept getting questions like, oh, yeah, I see you here a lot, you must work at the Capitol. And, you know, they kept asking me, who do you work for, you know, and um, I, at first I was very offended, you know, it, it's, it's kind of weird, you get elected office, I thought, gee, everybody should know who I am. But then I thought, you know, most of the people who are asking me this are lobbyists. And I'll go into that later. I'll talk more about lobbyists and what they do and what they don't do. Uh, but so I thought, you know, there's a way to turn this to my advantage. So next time somebody asks me, you know, uh, who are you and uh, who do you work for? You know, I said, you know, I work for this guy named Mike Gatto. <laughs> but don't ever come see him because he's a real jerk. <laughs> um, and um, last story, you know, about how Sacramento is different from regular life. So has anybody ever been to the Capitol? I know uh, Professor Queen has. Um, Okay, so you know there's this special elevator for members of the legislature. Nobody can ride it unless you're a member of the legislature. So one day I got in the elevator and uh, there's a tradition, there's all these old traditions in Sacramento, and one of the traditions in the elevator, the member's elevator, is to kind of make fun of people, right? So you'll get in there and one of your colleagues will be there and you might you know, pick on his tie or pick on his shoes or something and you, you kind of razz him and he razzes you back. So I got in and a guy started making some jokes and I started giving it right back. And he said, well, you know, young man, in a few short weeks, you're not going to have me to make fun of anymore. And I said, oh, geez, you know, did, did you lose an election? And he said, no. And I said, are you termed out of office? And he said, no. And I said, are you, are you pulling a Danny Gilmore and quitting on us? And he said, I am Danny Gilmore. <laughs> so it was a little awkward. My first few months in office were totally awkward. It, it was... Um, it was it literally, I mean, there's this old movie that way before my time, definitely way before yours, called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And that was sort of my experience. I mean, just regular guy going up to, going up to Sacramento. And it, it really was eye-opening. I mean, some of the things I went through. And, um, and I'll talk more about that later as well. But that's part of what I want to stress is um, 
you know, being in the legislature in our system of government, you are just a regular person. I mean, I am somebody who grew up in this community. I went to preschool in Glendale, uh, you know, lived here my whole life. And you literally are somebody from this part of the world who gets elected to represent all of you. So all of your thoughts, all of your wishes, all of the things that you think are important, it is my job to then uh, you know, try to represent those values in the state legislature, but also to just be one of the people who, who I represent. And so that's something that's been very near and dear to me. What is day-to-day -day life like? That's, that's the question I want to answer. So typically, we, we're in session. Whenever school is in session, we're up in Sacramento. So we get a break for, for Christmas holidays. We get a break for summer. We get a break for spring. But other than that, we are in Sacramento. And it's a Monday through Thursday, sometimes Monday through Friday job. We, we do things like writing bills, writing legislation. We do things like voting on bills, and both in committee and on the floor. So as everyone knows about how the committee system works, Anybody? Anyone want to raise their hand? Class just started. Too. Class just started. OK. <laughs> so if I were to introduce a bill on plastics, I want to introduce a bill that says these bottles have to be a minimum of 30% of recycled plastic. Good law, bad law? Anybody have any opinions? Good law. Good law, Good law. right? Good law, right? Because we want, to, uh, we want to encourage people to recycle. We want to use the recycled plastic. So that will be my, that's my bill idea. So I would introduce that bill. First step is writing it. You have to write it in the language that can be bill language, statutory language. And you have to think about how will this be interpreted, because there are these people called lawyers, and it is your job to interpret the law. And so you want to write it so there's no loopholes and so that it actually does what you want. So you would write the bill. Now, you ha we have a team of lawyers that help us. They're called legislative counsel. But ultimately, it is my job to read the bill, to sign it, to introduce it, and to make sure it's good. We only get 20 bills per year. We, can, we have 20 ideas. That's it. You can do 20 bills a year. That's the rules. So I use this as one of my ideas, 30% recycled material, all bottles sold in California. We then would introduce it. The bill would then get referred to a committee, a committee that has expertise on, what do you think? Right, expertise and resources. There's a committee that handles expertise in water, but the water they're talking about is more like the water that's in rivers. And there's committees that have expertise on everything from transportation to alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Uh, there's, there's, there's pretty much a committee that has jurisdiction over any idea that you can imagine. Now, something like this would probably go to the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources. And then it's the job of the members of that committee to pass initial judgment on the bill. They vote on it. Let's say there's seven members. You need four votes. And if you get your four votes, it then goes on to the next step. The next step could be another committee. Let's say there's another committee that has jurisdiction over uh, sales tax. And part of this will, you know, will affect the sales tax in the state of California. It might go before the tax committee. Where 90% of all bills end up before they hit the whole body to vote on is the Appropriations Committee. So that's the committee that I chair. And the Appropriations Committee, the job of us simply is to guard the taxpayer's money. It's that simple. So everybody's got great ideas, wonderful ideas. My idea here was to make all bottles sold in California you know, minimum of 30% post-consumer waste. But the question is, OK, well, how much will it cost to enforce this law? Uh, does, is there any uh, state agency that has to promulgate regulations? How much will it cost for them to draft the regulations? What will it do to our tax revenue in the state of California if people stop buying plastic bottles? Right? So there's a lot of considerations. And so any bill that affects the state of California with over $150,000 or more, which is just about anything. I mean, the state of California cannot have a thought without it costing somebody $150,000. Uh, those bills come before the Appropriations Committee. And then it's my job as chairman of the committee to determine if the, cost benefit, if the costs outweigh the benefits. So sometimes there are great ideas. Middle class scholarship, try to help people who want to go on to the UC or Cal State system. That costs the state $500 million. Right? A lot of money. But it's a really good idea. So on that one, I would say, well, the benefit definitely outweighs the cost. Uh, there's other bills. If, if you wanted, let's say you wanted to declare that the Dodgers were the official team of the state of California. Well, what would that do? It might be very popular in the southern part of the state. Northern part of the state, they're all Giants fans. They'd be very upset. It would cost money to redo our textbooks. You know, the state poppy, or state flower is the poppy. You know, state team is the Dodgers. We'd have to redo all of our textbooks and all of our seals and things like that. So there'd be a cost, probably millions of dollars. And the benefit? Not so good. The state would kind of be at war with each other. So I get to determine, eh, that's a stupid law. And then I make the recommendation in appropriations not to vote for it. And hopefully all of my committee, my fellow committee members follow me. 
They have never not. So we handle, uh, I've been chairman for almost two years. We've handled several thousands of bills. They've always followed me, which is good. It's good to have the, uh, the backing of your peers, I guess is one way of putting it. How do committees work? First of all, I want to extend an invitation to all of you to come up to Sacramento at any time. You should watch your government in action. It's amazing how committees work. First of all, before that bill hits the committee, it will be thoroughly analyzed. Somebody who's on staff of the state of California will do an analysis of my bill, right, on the, the post-consumer waste. They will talk about the current state of recyclable plastics available. They will talk about who supplies them. They will talk about who, uh, you know, if there's enough supply. They will talk about its effect on the water. You know, sometimes consumer waste could be more dirty, recyclable materials. The bill will be analyzed so thoroughly for substance and cost that by the time it comes to committee, hopefully, if all of us did our homework, we already know what the bill's gonna do, and we can vote on it. The number of bills we vote on a year is staggering. It is staggering. And that's why I encourage you to come up to Sacramento sometime to watch it for yourself. It's just like a splash of cold water in your face. The Appropriations Committee, we regularly vote on about 100 bills a day when we're in session, 100 bills. So you imagine 100 ideas, many of these bills are this thick, it's, there's a lot of people with a lot of ideas out there, right? But we, we feel like we analyze them in tremendous amount. But it can be very jarring for members of the public. Often members of the public will come up. There might be a bill that affects something in their life. Uh, some of the most controversial bills are bills that affect animals. There might be a bill saying, for example, that every dog in the state of California must be spayed or neutered. And those will really, really get the dog breeders very upset. They say, well, I breed dogs. I don't want to prevent my dogs from having children. So you will come up to testify. You will put on your Sunday finest. You will come to the committee room. You will be prepared to testify, and the bill will take maybe one minute on the calendar. It's a, dare I say, it's a really interesting way and sometimes not the best way to make laws, but it's an eye-opener. It's an eye-opener on how much of our work is done behind the scenes. But anyway, so assuming my bill gets its way through the committees, it then goes for a vote on the full floor, and of course, on the full floor and in committees, it's my job to articulate to all of my peers why this bill has merit. So I would get up and say, you know, we don't recycle enough in California. We are wasting too many resources. We, we are using too much uh, natural gas, because actually plastic in many cases is made from natural gas, not necessarily petroleum. And uh, we need to recycle more, and this bill is worth it, and please vote on it. And if it passed, it would repeat the entire process in the Senate. And if the Senate passed it as well, it would go for the governor for a signature. And once the governor signs it, it becomes the law of the state of California. So that's just the legal aspect and, and what we do in terms of passing laws. But another thing we do, of course, is constituent service. And I want to introduce really quickly my staff who is here today. So first, of course, is Suzanne Dunwell. She's my senior field rep. In the back is Eric Menhibar. And my newest staff member, Alexis Miller. So I have one staff in Sacramento, they work at the Capitol full time, and their job is legislation and policy. Down here, I have another staff that does some policy, but they also do constituent service. So what is that? So I'll make another offer to you, which is call my office anytime. If you need something done, if you feel like government has failed you, at any level of government, call my office. If you have a cousin who is going through the federal system and they're trying to get their citizenship, but the federal official who handles citizenship has not, has not listened, call my office. We will try to handle it. If you have a problem with the city, there, there is a pothole in your street, and the city has not filled the pothole. They have not delivered the services they're supposed to do. Call my office. We will try to deal with it. The way that my constituent service, now obviously the state issues are things like DMV. You're having a problem with the DMV. You're having a problem with your state taxes. Those are the things that are directly in our jurisdiction. The way that our constituent services program works is you have a problem with government, which can happen, and uh, you call my office, my staff works tirelessly to solve your problem, and then I get the credit. It's a great system. <laughs> but in all seriousness, <laughs> um, my number is 818-558-3043. You call us anytime. That is, what my, that is another component of my job, right, is dealing with this type of issue. And the issues we deal with down here in our district are profound. I mean, they can be an issue of, will we locate a stop on the new rail line? Will it be located on the Glendale side of the border or the Los Angeles side of the border, right? That could affect the property values. There, there might be some people who really want to be next to the train. Those could be businesses. 
And there could be some people who really don't want to be next to the train. Those could be homeowners, right? So those are some of the things that we, we deal with. We also deal with opinions on legislation. Of the 2,000 or so bills that are introduced every year, there might be a bill that directly affects your life. It happens all the time. Right now, there's a bill going through the process that would affect the admissions process for Cal State and UC schools. As you can imagine, we are getting thousands of emails every day from students saying vote this way or vote that way, because this is something that directly affects their lives. So if you ever want to weigh in on a bill, if you ever just want to complain, we're used to it, then give me a call, send me an email. I read every email, I respond to every email. That's a, that's a commitment that I made before I ran for office. So that is just a little flavor of my day. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about lobbyists because that is something that some people in this room have actually engaged in. I know that Professor Queen in the back just was up, up in Sacramento lobbying me what, last week, Monday. right? Monday. So, um, so now he's what I would call a white hat lobbyist. He's a good lobbyist. He's, lo he's lobbying for education, right? For something that we all really care about. But there's a lot of what are called black hat lobbyists or just general lobbyists in the state too. If I were to open my day, if I were to open my door and my scheduler were to go out and say, hey lobbyists, my boss is here, he will meet with you the entire day. I would have a meeting every 15 minutes for an hour from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. all day, every day, 365 days a year. There are that many lobbyists in the state of California. There are that many issues that they care about. There are that many special interest groups paying lobbyists in the state of California. So when I say to you to get involved in your government and talk about the issues that matter to you, this is not just a challenge and not just a suggestion. It is a, it is a bit of advice for your very survival, right? The plastic companies, they have lobbyists. The oil companies, they have lobbyists. The people who make your shirts, they have lobbyists. People who make your pens, they have lobbyists. The people who make jewelry have lobbyists. People who make clocks have lobbyists. The people who give massages, they have lobbyists. The people who hate the people who give massages, they have lobbyists. <laughs> the podiatrists have lobbyists. The people who fight the podiatrists for rights to work on the, angle, on the ankle, they have lobbyists. The trial lawyers have lobbyists. The doctors have lobbyists. The environmentalists have lobbyists. The people who hate them have lobbyists. Everybody has lobbyists, but you know what? Ultimately, our job, my job, is to listen to the people. When you stop listening to the people, you've lost all touch. That's why I read all emails. That's why I try to listen to you. But that's also why I encourage you to get involved. There are so many pressures for our state resources. There's so many. There are so many people looking for tax breaks. There are so many people looking for handouts. But ultimately, one of the core things that is so important for the state to do, right, is to educate our citizens. And that's why it's so refreshing when I see Professor Queen coming up and talking in Sacramento because I know that he's coming from a very pure, pure perspective. He wants to talk about education, the people who provide it and the people who get it. And so I feel like I can listen to him. He's a very trusted resource, right? And I feel like, quite frankly, you know, he brought up some students when he came and met with me on Monday. If I was talking with one of you about education, I would feel like I could trust you, like I could really listen to you because you're living this every day, right? But the demands on our time are immense, and some of my colleagues are not necessarily as, um, they don't have the same philosophy that I do. So get involved, write letters, advocate for yourself. I mean, if, if you don't do it, there's nobody else who will. Because the truth is, there is not necessarily a lobbyist who represents students, right? It's gonna, it's gonna fall on you, it's gonna fall on you. So listen, I never make this a monologue, I want it to be a dialogue, so if it's at all possible, what I'd like to do is just open it up for questions and answers, you can ask me absolutely anything, anything at all. Anything about my past, anything about my present, anything about how I feel on issues, anything about what I do. If there's something I said that wasn't clear, by all means ask. So, and by the way, I think I'm gonna make that the professors can't ask. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right, go ahead, any questions? We have solved all the problems of the state of California in 30 minutes. All right, well, yes, we have a question. Great. Um, I have a question about uh, tax transparency and um, how do we know how, how the state of California is spending our taxes? Great question. Well, the answer is like much else today, it's on a website. Uh, you can go to a website, I forget the exact URL, but it's something like budget.ca.gov. And there's also, a, there's also a third party provider, I wanna say called Next10, N-E-X-T 10 and the number 10, 
where you can, not only can you go on these websites and find out exactly how the state is spending the money in, in various categories, but you can also go and, you can also go and um, there's like little exercises you can engage in where you could say, well, wait a minute, I want to try to balance the budget because I think I could do it better than the legislature. And they'll give you all the data and you can try to balance it. You can say, well, you know, guess what? My, my aunt is a single mother and she wants to get back in the workforce and the state provides her subsidized childcare. Ah, you know what, I'm gonna cut that program. Forget her, you know, she, she's not gonna get her kids taken care of because I wanna give the money more towards the community college system, right? And that's, those are the decisions we face every day. But it's really good for you to do one of these exercises because I think it makes people realize that with every decision we make on a budgetary level, there is a winner and a loser. It's a zero sum game. And there are people who are advocating for a small pool of money. So I can give you a general overview of the budget. Um, does anyone, so does anyone know where most of our budget dollars go for? No? So there was a proposition passed uh, two decades ago, Prop 98. It specifies that roughly 40% of all tax dollars go through K through 14 education. So that's, it's kindergarten through traditional high school plus the community college system. The problem is, when it was passed, it was designed to be an absolute floor. It was said, well, we're gonna pass this as a minimum. But like much else in life, when you set a targeted number and you say, well, this is gonna be the minimum, it became the ceiling. It became both the floor and the ceiling. So every year, we, the state of California just barely meets this criteria, and in some years, we actually borrow right, from, from future years of revenues for this. And so, but 40% of every tax dollar goes through K through 14 education. And then there's another 10% spent on higher ed, and, and then there's, I think, 17 cents of every dollar goes to local governments, counties, and local school districts, and cities. And there's really very little left over for, for a lot of the other programs that are very important. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, you said it's 20 bills only, mm -hmm. and that's all. Why is that? Well, I think it's because it's just a sheer... Yeah, it's, it's just sheer workload issue. I mean, so there, California is a big state, but we still have, we have just 40 senators and there's 80 members of the, of, the legis of the assembly. So there's 120 of us. And you imagine if we did 20 bills a year each, that's 2,400 bills. And each bill is, I mean, it changes California law. It's, it's, it can be profoundly complicated. Many of them, I'm, you know, I encourage you to read them. They're all on a site called Ledge Info, like Ledge for legislative legginfo.ca.gov. You can go on there, you can search by my last name, you can read of all my ideas. But um, these are complex pieces of legislation and, and you know, there's only so much time and so much space and so much room to analyze them and vote on them. So we had to limit it because people were introducing way too many bills and it just, you know, there aren't that many good ideas. I mean, if someone's got a great idea for solving all of the state's problems, let me know. But the reality is there aren't that many good ideas. Yes. I have a question. With the impl implementation of healthcare reform, are service fees going to be passed on to the consumer? Service fees for? Like I saw a receipt online um, at the San Francisco airport, and it said uh, healthcare reform fee. Yeah, okay. So that seems like that's, the, the question was, will the costs for, for the Federal Health Care Act, which some people call Obamacare, will that be passed on to the consumer? I mean, you know, it's hard to tell. That example was a very probably mean-spirited way to, for a business owner to grumpily tell his consumers that he or she was upset that they had to pay for health care costs for their employees, so they wanted to pass it on to their consumer. But you know, the, the, the real answer to this question is everything is always passing the consumer. I mean, an economy is only as big as it is. I mean, the, 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 the United States GDP is based on our, you know, how much gross domestic product that, that the, the aggregate sum of all of our citizens you know, create and how much every year we spend and how much, how much money supply there is in the United States. And, and those things don't change, right? The priorities shift, right? So no matter what, those costs will get passed on. They always do. I mean, I'm trying to think of another way of, of saying this. So if the state of California, for example, spends let's pick a number that's, let's say this state of California spends about $100 billion a year. We have to get that tax, that, those tax revenues from somebody. 
they will always, the state will always need to generate $100 billion in revenue. That doesn't change. The priorities might change. It might shift between which industries are taxed and which are not, but ultimately it is the consumer always who buys every good and service, right? So ultimately we always pay for it. It's not like any business owner is going to say, gee, I'm gonna start you know, lowering my profit margin. And I'm not. So I mean, I guess, I guess the answer is yes, everything is always passed on, but that example still is a little bit more uh, like dramatic than it probably could be. Other questions? Yes. Are you supportive of SB 850 with the Institute of Medicine um, recommending that by 2020, 80% of nurses become baccalaureate prepared? There's a huge challenge on our nursing students. And um, there was this uh, SB 850 uh, that suggests at least one area um, that uh, the consumers need and health, uh, uh, healthcare delivery and nurses are one of them uh, to have a baccalaureate program in, co in a community, in community college. Yeah. Yes. So I, uh, that bill got introduced this year, right? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, in the back you asked like, why, why do we limit the number of bills? I mean, we're already up to Senate Bill 850. Yeah. <laughs> We've been in session for like, you know, eight weeks. And I'm trying to think, and you know, I have, I have a constituent here, somebody I care about, you know, and I'm supposed to represent. How do you feel about SB 850? And I'm trying to think like, well, I voted on SB 850 last year and the year before and the year before. It was something totally different, you know, and, but this is a new one that just got introduced. And I think it would allow for, if I'm not mistaken, for community colleges to offer a nursing degree. I see no reason why not, right? It would be, it would be a very, no, no, but, but this would not be, this would be a, a full, yeah, bachelor's, right? Or, yeah. So, so this would be kind of landmark, because right now, obviously, what's the degree you get at a community college? Associates, right? This would allow community colleges in certain circumstances, nursing, for example, to offer a bachelor's degree. I see, why not? I mean, it makes sense to me. And will the Appropriations Committee pay for that additional cost? <laughs> we, don't, we don't have a choice. <laughs> if, if, we, if we let it out, we're paying for it, so, uh, yeah. Yes? Um, in Glenda, in California, especially in Glenda, is there any restriction or rule you can pass so landlords, uh, uh, they um, raise the rent as much as they want. Can you pass some rule for this so sure. there be certain amount of rent? Well, not, for example, uh, out of seven in one year, they want, and like they sleep the next day, they will probably say, okay, we want to raise your rent for three hundred dollars. Yeah. So the question was about rent control, right? And yeah, the the um, the, the rent, yeah rent control in California has a long history. For a while, it was legal to have what are called rent ceilings, and there were a few cities, uh, Santa Monica, Berkeley, and a few other cities that had rent ceilings, and they said this is the maximum you can charge on rent. In response to that, I think in the 1970s, the legislature passed laws saying that you could not have rent ceilings, but you could have rent control. You could control how much you could raise it per year. But they gave it to the city to determine. So in Los Angeles, in, if you live in, how many people live in Los Angeles City? Okay, a few. So in Los Angeles City, you know that if you live in a building of two units or more, that, that they can only raise your rent based on the consumer price index, AKA inflation, every year. Current CPI is 3%, if that. So they can raise your rent 3% a year. Now some people say, well, this is terrible. There's a reason why certain cities like, well, but, but here, here are the counter argument. So some people say, there's a reason why Los Angeles has more bad neighborhoods than Glendale. And that's because the landlords there, they can't make a profit. So they don't put the money back in their building. Very few landlords want to own a junky building, but because they can only raise the rent 3% a year, they don't put the money back in their building. They might, rather than growing grass and having a nice landscaped area, they throw a cactus there and they you know, let it be and there's some dust and some rocks. You know. so, so there are both arguments. Could I do something to allow, Glen it would have to be Glendale officials. I'm happy to talk with them. Uh, they would have to pass it here in the city of Glendale. And you know, it, it'd be tough. It'd be, I mean, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I think it would be a, a tough, yes, follow-up question. All right, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and also in Glendale, like two bedrooms, um they charge uh, 1950 right. And then mm -hmm. you were talking about putting money back on the uh, house or home, whatever, sure. like apartment building. But they don't. 
They built yeah. in Glendale, most of the land group. Uh, they say, okay, if you want good fruit, you can do it. Sure. It's up to sure. If you want to do this, and they don't even care about what's going on. If something is not working, it's uh, the, the tenant's uh, responsibility to fix it because they they already got used to it. Yeah, and I mean, I try to be as candid as possible with every audience, and there's certain things that government can solve, there's certain things government can't. In a situation like that, I would suggest voting with your feet. I mean, you know, it's the best way to tell that landlord that you're not going to put up with those high rent prices and the fact that they're not maintaining the building is to move. And if enough people move, they won't be able to command. I know it's hard to move, but they won't be able to command their 1950 for a two-bedroom. There's beautiful places in Atwater for for, <laughs> for, for 1500 bucks. But. Next question. Yes. Uh, how and why did you get into law? Um, actually, it's a very good question. So. You know, I was working in politics and doing some other things, doing some work in nonprofits and things like that. And one day I sort of woke up and I looked around and I realized that everybody that I respected had a law degree. Not everybody. I mean, there's some people who, who didn't. But, but by and large, most people who I really admired had a law degree. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to go back to law school. I went to night law school. I didn't go to day law school. I kept a full-time job and then worked, went to school at night. And I said, I'm just going to go to law school to sharpen my brain. I'm, I'm actually not going to do anything with a degree. I'm just going to go to get the degree. Really weird. I mean, just bizarre. And, uh, and then when I got into law school, I said, you know what? I'm going to be a DA. I, I want to put criminals behind bars, you know, and I'm really upset at certain crimes and blah, blah, blah. But then I got my first semester grades. And law school is really weird. I mean, uh, law school is um, it's the only thing. I mean, it was, it was total news to me. So first of all, law school, how many people here are considering going to law school? Just a few, that's it. Do you know about the grading system? So it's graded on a strict bell curve, right? So law school, at my law school, 68% of every class had to get a C. And then I think it was 13% of every class had to get a D, 13% of every class had to get a B, and 5% of every class got an A or an F. So it, it's like, first of all, it's, it's like no educational experience you've ever had. I mean, it, it's, it's really competitive. I mean, you guys have seen Legally Blonde. It's like that. <laughs> you know, it really is. And, and, uh, and then the other thing that's weird is you don't apply for jobs. They come and find you. So if you get good grades, the big law firms will come on campus and say, hey, we want you to work for us. And they recruit you. And so after my first semester, my school gave me a full scholarship. And then law firms were knocking on my door and said, we want you to come work for us. And so I took a job in law, and I loved it. I mean, I thought it was great. I mean, you get to help people in a different way. You get to do something that's very cerebral. And you are you know, interpreting the laws that govern society. So I thought it was really cool. And um, I thought it was terrific. And I, I can't say enough good things about law. I mean, look, I know lawyers are about the most hated profession in the world after politicians, right? And I'm both, right? So, so uh, but um, actually lobbyists, right? Lobbyists are up there too. But, um, but I, I really think it's, it's really just a wonderful career choice. So if anybody's thinking about it, it's really great. And it opens so many doors. You can do so many things with it. What yes. made you run for, to become part of the assembly? Yeah, so I mean, um, it, it's, it's kind of what I alluded to in the, in the beginning when I said that um, at some point I got so sick of opening up the newspaper and being so angry about what they were doing in Sacramento, right? And it, it was so abstract. What are they doing? You know? But then you realize, like, look, I'm, I'm an American and the government is me. I can become part of the government, right? And so I thought um, I got so upset with, with how they were mismanaging things that I, but at some point, it also came with, it, with an implicit challenge. And the challenge was, OK, OK, smart guy. You think you can do better? Well, then, you know what? S go do better. You know, give up your, I had a great life. I mean, my, my commute did not involve a jet. I was living in beautiful Los Angeles. I love it here. You know, I, um, you know, I had a 10-minute drive to my law firm. I was making much more money than I make now. But at some point, I thought, you know, you have to challenge yourself. If you think you can do better, if you think you have good ideas, and you think that they are, you know, more meritorious than other people, then, then run for office and get involved. And so that's what I decided to do. Yeah, follow up. Yeah, sure. Um, and where are your plans for the future in regards to your career? Um, you know, I love what I'm doing. Uh, I'll be termed out of office in 2016. So 2016 is the maximum that I can serve in the state assembly. 
From that point, I could run for Senate, I could run for something else, or I could go back to practicing law. And I don't know what I'm going to do. So, I, you know, I, right, it, sound, it sounds corny, it sounds corny, but, but, but right now I'm focused on being the best darn assemblyman I could be. And that's, you know, I got some advice when I, when I, uh, when I was running for office from, from an old Congress member. And, and I think you can appreciate this because it's, it's good advice. He said, you know, raise a ton of money, don't screw anybody over, do a good job, and the rest will take care of itself. <laughs> you know, so. Other questions? Yes. Um, I noticed you talked about economics and um, the financial aspects of the government. It's really important to like, the well-being of the state and everything. Uh, did you ever have to like study economics or math? Or like, were, did you focus time in consumerism? Yeah, so, so look, my degree, my degree is in ancient history, right? I mean, I, I went to, uh, I went to I did two years at Berkeley, then I did a period at Los Angeles Community College, and then I did two years at UCLA. So, but my degree is in ancient history, which some people might laugh at and say, gee, that's so irrelevant. But I guarantee every problem that the United States has ever had, the Greeks and Romans had 2,000 years ago. Um, but, but, um, but what I have done is um, simply, I read a lot. I mean, I love books on economics. And there's, there's two books I've read in the last year that have absolutely blown my mind, and, and I think they are just terrific, terrific books. One of them is called The New Depression, and it's by an economist named Richard Duncan, who's a great story. He's a guy that grew up in poverty in like rural Kentucky, and now he runs this billion-dollar hedge fund in Asia. And he's written this book about how paper money is a new development, and how the influx of credit in society is a relatively new development. And he thinks that it will come crashing down. He thinks that it will end poorly. And this is not some crazy right or left wing guy. He is a total political agnostic. He is an economist of the highest degree. He's very well respected. But he thinks that our current system of paper money, which is a new development, uh, you know, it, relatively new. I mean, it, in, in this country, we've only had a pure non gold standard, non you know, non back dollar in full since. There was Bretton Woods one and Bretton Woods two. I think the second one was 1968, and the first one was in the 1930s or 1920s when we went off the gold standard fully. And he thinks that this will actually come crashing down at some point. It's a fascinating book, and it's something that I think will affect everybody's life in here. The second book that I read was actually by a former Republican Congress member named David Stockman. He was President Reagan's head of the Office of Budget Management at the federal level. And his book is called um, The Great Deformation. And he's talked about how various forces, and it's astounding to read this, because he's a, he's a Republican, most Republican you can be. And he just is brutal on Republican politicians, on Democratic politicians, for how much they have deformed our economy. Same thing, he comes to the same conclusions as this other economist in a totally different way. So they're really fascinating books, but I just, I read a lot. You know, education is a continual thing. It never stops. I mean, if, if you want to be good at what you do, and I think everybody in this room does, or you wouldn't be getting an education, you got to keep it up. you got to keep doing it. So um, I just try to read a lot. Other questions? Go for it. Um, so it sounds like you have a very busy schedule, busy life, yeah. and you talk to a lot of people, you do a lot of presentations. How do you manage your time, or how do you keep Keep it all together. That's a great question. So work-life balance, school-life balance, right? How many of you have jobs besides going to school? Okay, a lot, right? So, so it's so important. Um, does anybody here think they see their family enough? Right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a sad, sad fa function in the modern world. I just do it by setting some rules. I mean, my rules are that I am never away from my family more than three nights. So even if I get off, if I get asked to give a talk, you know, I, I get invited to Israel every year, I get invited to Armenia every year, I get invited to at least one other trip, Spain or Ireland to go study their rail system or something like that. If I go, I bring my family. It's just simple, that's my simple rule. Uh, the other thing is on Sundays, Sundays are sacred. Sundays for me is a family day and a day for me to just do nothing and whatever. Now, it's not, that's not always possible. Sometimes, sometimes there'll be some big group asking me to give a speech on a Sunday, but I will often forswear that opportunity if it means I get to spend more time with my family. Um, other than that, I mean, it's, you know, I am just as guilty as everybody in this room of screwing up all the time and 
not being a good enough brother and father and you know, everything like that. Um, so, but, but I think that's one of the problems that plagues you know, the modern existence. I mean, it, you, you talk about our schedules, and then you add on like, these things, which you know, people are probably got 100 emails in the last, you know, in the last hour. But, um, but you know, it's, it's, um, it's something that can be done, but it's, it's not easy. I'll, let me get him, and then I'll come back to you. Go ahead. It's might be a weird question, but how do you respond to people who say that politicians are liars? Like, for example, if you take a kid who's growing up in a household where he's always hearing from his parents that, oh, politicians are liars and this and that, and he's going to be probably discouraged to look into politics and know all the you know, laws and everything. How do you respond to those? No, that's a very, very good question. So, so the question is, I, guess, I think, gets to the core of why there's so, mis, so much mistrust in our system right now. I mean... Look, there are a portion of politicians who are liars, and there is a portion of doctors who are liars, and there is a portion of policemen who are lawyer, liars, and lawyers who are liars, and, and you know, everything like that, right? I mean, every profession, I think, the only profession that probably has no liars at all are academics, right? I mean, <laughs> but, 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 um, but no, I mean, it's, it's also hard when, when people also, when people also run for office and they make all these promises, that they know that they can't keep. So I can't control my peers, and I really ultimately can't control what people think. But the only thing that I can try to do myself is, first of all, be real. If someone asks me a question, you know, it, like, like I was asked, like, you know, can I do something about Glendale landlords? I mean, the answer is I can't. And if you had another politician up here, he might say or she might say, oh, yeah, I'll get right on that. I'll, I'll, I promise, you know, if you vote for me, by the next election, I will have solved this problem. Not my style, not my style. The second thing is to stay in touch. Ultimately, like I said at the beginning, everybody in this room who lives in my district is my boss, right? So I have to answer emails, I have to answer phone calls, I have to make the government be friendly to the people we serve. That's what I try to do, I mean, it's, it's just that simple formula. But it's hard because people are jaded and they are fed up and they are tired and they are upset with you know, a whole lot of politicians who seem to be self-serving. So, but, but all of you, though, too, can also help spread the word. You, know, you, can, you can go out there and just talk about your experiences because if you participate in a lot of the programs here and a lot of things like that, that Professor Queen does coming up and meeting with us and Professor Hoffman, you, know, you will see government more firsthand and you might feel like you're more listened to and you might say, hey, they're not so bad. They can't solve all the problems, but they're not so bad. I'll go you and then you, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I am a um, part-time um, job worker and also I'm uh, almost full-time student here. But I have a question about my situation and your uh, budget decisions that you sure. make today. For example, I have no job security, I have no housing, I have housing problems, and then I'm at school, uh, all of them reflect on my life and my um, grades and all the situation. So, um, do you think uh, it's necessary to bring budget to education or a little bit increase the level of life of poor and yes. lower class? Absolutely, and, and this is something I know, I know we have to wrap up in five minutes, but, but, but this is one of the most important issues that I want to talk about today, and it, it would be wrong to, to come to an, a higher education institution and not talk about this issue. So the first thing I want to say is, when, when there is a problem, now how many people here think that colleges and universities are totally adequately funded? Is there anybody? Okay, I don't think so either. Now let me ask you another question, okay? How many of you want to go on to like a UC or a Cal State? At some point, okay, right? Lots of people, okay? So I went, I went to UCLA, hopefully you guys heard that, except just five minutes ago, hopefully you're listening. Now, but, but, but let me ask you another question, because this is important. Anybody here interested in running for office someday? Okay, a few of you want it, will admit it at least. How many people, how many, how many of you think that even the most jaded politician runs for office so that he or she can destroy higher education? Does anybody really believe that? I mean, we talk about, faith in politicians, right? So, so if we agree that education is not adequately funded, but we agree that very few politicians, especially, especially UC graduates, run for office with the goal of destroying higher education, you have to ask yourself why. Why is it that every year, year in, year out, California does not have enough money 
to pay for all the things we want in higher education. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you my research. When I was running for office, I went to this former elected official and I said, hey, sir, I want your endorsement. I want you to back me. And he said, get the hell out of my office. You know, good kid, blah, 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 blah. You don't know enough. I will endorse you only when you know about California. And I said, how do I know about California, oh Buddha? And I was rubbing his belly. <laughs> and he said, he, said, um, he said, well, you need to read this and 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 this. So he gave me the stack of reading that was like this. And I read everything, everything. And then I went back and talked with him. I got his endorsement. But, but one of the things that I was struck by is in California, how much of our budget is spoken for by special interest before it comes to the legislature. So does anyone, are anyone familiar with those? Uh, how, how many people registered vote, first of all? Okay, most. Okay, so, so it's election year. You guys are familiar with those propositions, right? Those ballot propositions in California. You know, you, you can picture the ads on TV around election year. Uh, you know, they've got the, the, the nurse and the doctor and the firefighter, and it's, it's, hey, you need to vote for this or puppy dogs everywhere will die, right? <laughs> and, and it won't raise taxes, but it'll do these wonderful benefits. Well, did you know that California is one of the only states in the union that allows those things to be determined that way? The federal constitution, anybody a fan of the federal constitution? It's been amended how many times? 27 times, since 1790. What's in the federal constitution? Free speech, freedom of religion, right? Things like that. You know the California constitution? It's been amended 521 times in 90 years. The California Constitution, federal constitution, free speech. California Constitution, which kind of trammel net you can use while rock fishing, okay? Now, a constitution, a constitution binds the legislature. I have no ability. Just like, just like Congress can't change the constitution, well, they could, they could go through the process. But in California, the, the legislature has zero ability to change the constitution. So, Every single special interest group has written a protection in the Constitution over the years. This is, when I was studying about California and its dysfunction, every single thing that the state spends money on, everything, with a few exceptions, but every major category that the state spends money on has a protection written in the Constitution by a special interest group or a federal court decision. There are two exceptions, the court system and higher education. Because, right, who advocates for the courts? Nobody does. And who advocates for higher education? There's no special interest, there's no, no industry. And you say, no, that can't possibly be true. Mike, there's no way it's written in the California Constitution that we have to spend a certain amount of money to build mental health facilities every year. Yes, there is. You, you, Mike, wait a minute, wait a minute. The state of California does, does tobacco education, don't they? I've seen those ads with the person smoking through the hole in their chest, right, or the hole in their neck. And I read the fine print. I said, the state pays for this with our tax dollars, your tax dollars, my tax dollars. No way that's written in the Constitution. Yes, it is. So I, I want that to sink in for a minute. We spend money every year hiring Hollywood producers to put ads of persons smoking through their little holes. We could call it tobacco education. But higher education has no protections. So when we go back to our question, which is, would anybody ever run for office with the goal of getting the UC system? The answer is more often than not, they don't have a choice. Because so much has been written in our constitution. So many different pots of money are spoken for by federal court decisions, by, by ballot propositions, that at some point there's very little flexibility left. And if you look at what has been cut every year most steadily since 2008, it's the court system and it's the UC and CSU system. And this has to change. So, so what's the answer? Well, first of all, we need to start getting some of the junk out of the Constitution. And every year I introduce legislation to do this, and every year it fails. And the other, the other answer is don't vote for this stuff. Don't, don't believe the ads. When you're watching TV this November, and there's an ad that says, we're going to spend X billions of dollars, and it blah, 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 and it doesn't raise taxes, don't believe it. That money comes from somewhere. The, the state of California gets a certain amount of tax dollars every year. And if someone speaks for it, right, that money's gone. Everyone familiar with the term three strikes and you're out? Okay, three strikes, written in the Constitution. You steal a slice of pizza for your third strike. You go to jail for life. You say, well, that doesn't, well, yes, it does. It costs $47,000 a year to house an inmate. 
$200,000 a year if that person is under 18. And it's paid for by you, by me, by all of us. And it would probably cost a lot less to educate that person, right? But it's, go ahead. Uh, actually, I appreciate this system because it gave me um, many opportunities to improve my life. Right. But I'm talking about uh, the people who I heard uh, on the news. They are very high educated people, but suddenly they uh, lost everything and became homeless. That's possible. It's possible. But those are all the pressures of funding. I mean, if you're talking about homeless relief, I mean, those are all pressures of funding. And I see the hook is coming. So well, now we, it's- We have you on a roll and you talked about the balance of family and work and yes. the like, and we want to respect that thank balance. Thank you. And, but, and we, go ahead. Let me say thank you to all of you for listening. And um, thank you for all of your wonderful input. Thank you for having me. And I meant what I said. If you want to send me an email, go to my website. You can. If you want to, uh, have questions about internships or if you have questions about financial aid that's available those are also some other things we can help with and again thank you so much for listening and um, look forward to seeing you again thank you thank you very much Assemblymember Gatto has a, uh, a goal uh, to restore greatness to California, and I think we got a little sense of that passion and that feel for restoring greatness to California. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much.